well as the Macmillan Center for International Studies, among many, many others. Um, Luis's visit to the Research Triangle can be considered somewhat of a return to a familiar place, since it wasn't so long ago that she was a PhD candidate at Duke University's Department of Anthropology, where she worked with Professor Charlie Pio, who I think is going to stream in at some point, either virtually or in person. Um, Luisa's research intersects a wide range of critical themes related to the state, statelessness, borderlands, migration, ethical life, and military infrastructures in contemporary Africa, with a special focus on the Central African Republic and Rwanda. In addition to her rich repertoire of articles, which have been published in the Journal of Refugee Studies, the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute and African Affairs, among others, she is the author of two books. Uh, her first book, State of Rebellion, Violence and Intervention in the Central African Republic, was published by Zed Books and the University of Chicago in 2016. And her second book, Hunting Game, Raiding Politics in the Central African Republic, was published by Cambridge University Press in the year 2020. Her research has been funded from the National Science Foundation, the Wenner Grant Foundation for Anthropological Research, the Social Science Research Council, and the Harry Guggenheim Foundation. I have had the good fortune of knowing Luisa for close to a decade um, since she was one of my advisors in graduate school. Uh, from her generous spirit to patience, there are many, many things I can say about her as a scholar, colleague and friend. Perhaps what I have appreciated and continue to appreciate the most about Luisa as a scholar is her respect for ethnography as perspective. For example, in her first book, State of Rebellion, Louisa invites readers to think through the relevance of ethnography, arguing, and I quote, with ethnographic research, it is not simply that everything is game for inclusion in the analytical mix at a point in time, but that the composition of the mix and one's take on it are always up for revision. It is precisely this openness that imbues Luisa's work with theoretical density and empirical richness. And at a time where Africa's place in the world is taking on new meanings, Luisa's call to study state-run infrastructures from a people perspective opens new territory in which to ask questions about security, morality, and civility at this juncture in the 21st century. So this evening, Louisa has kindly agreed to share with us some emergent insights from her forthcoming book manuscript, which is tentatively titled Rules of Cosmopolitan Engagement, which is currently under contract with Princeton University Press. So without further ado, I invite all of you to join me, either in person or in the virtual world, um, to put your hands together and welcome Professor Lombard to our group. Thank you so much, Alia, for that incredibly generous introduction. You know, I used to do this a lot of traveling around and getting to visit places and talk with students, um, give talks. And then because of COVID, it's been a couple of years since I've done it. So it's really such a thrill, a pleasure to be back here. And I can't wait to hear your questions and comments and thank everyone for making this possible. It's such a treat. So as Alia mentioned, today I will be speaking. Hi, Stephen. <laughs> today I'll be speaking about <laughs> Uh, some research that I've been doing with Rwandan soldiers who are working as peacekeepers. And I'm working on a book on this topic. And so I decided that for this talk today, I would try to give you a kind of overview of some of what I've been looking at. And hopefully you can tell me what you find interesting, what you think I should follow further and, and what you think maybe I should leave to the, to the side for now. So let's get going. You know, Central Africa's history, it reminds me of Rwanda's history. Jean-Baptiste, a Rwandan officer, spoke eagerly as we sat chatting with a counselor at the mayor's office. There we go, okay. Now we're up and running. Jean-Baptiste, a Rwandan officer, spoke eagerly as we sat chatting with a counselor at the mayor's office in the neighborhood of the Central African capital, Bangui, that had been the worst, that had seen the worst of the violence that has pummeled the country for the last 10 years. Jean-Baptiste was a Rwandan officer serving as part of the United Nations peacekeeping mission in the Central African Republic, which had deployed several years previously. The counselor had been narrating the CAR's travails 
And in his story, Jean-Baptiste saw many parallels to his own country's history of political violence. What your president did, that was the same thing that our president did to us. The leaders fomented social cleavages and hatred that served their interests. But in reality, Jean-Baptiste continued, there is nothing. He meant the divisions were a mystification. They weren't real. Jean-Baptiste shook his head in reflection. What you're saying reminds me so much of my history. Just keep talking. One day it'll take. We said goodbye to the counselor and climbed into a land cruiser to drive across town. We got into a traffic jam outside the main civilian headquarters of the UN mission. There were probably a hundred giant white SUVs with UN painted on them in big black block letters taking up the entire roadway. Jean-Baptiste commented, the UN squanders everything. What a waste. You could get by on one third of the budget that they use. You could just do what we do at the Ministry of Defense in Kigali. We have a few buses that pick up all the employees. You know you have to stand outside your door at a certain time and they take you. It would be so much less wasteful. Then he noted the garbage that fills the roadsides in Bangui and how Central Africans, especially the poor, should really be composting their food scraps for their kitchen gardens. I wanted to open this talk by taking, with you, taking you with me for part of a morning with Jean-Baptiste because these little vignettes illustrate some of the demographic shifts that have been taking place in peacekeeping recently. Increasingly, the big peacekeeping missions are in Africa and increasingly they are staffed by Africans. So now we have a peacekeeper from a country with its own history of peacekeeping offering fellowship and know-it-all advice to a near neighbor and castigating the UN for its wastefulness at the same time as he is now himself part of that United Nations. Now, over the course of several years and with approval from the Rwandan Ministry of Defense, I've spent time with current and former Rwandan peacekeepers, both at home in Rwanda and in places where they are deployed, mostly the CAR and South Sudan, um, but also Mozambique although Mozambique needs a great big asterisk because they are not peacekeepers in Mozambique. That is a combat um, operation. And yes, please do ask me about that later. Now, peacekeeping in its current multilateral form dates to the 1950s. And the idea was that impartial soldiers could be deployed to places where previously warring parties had recently signed a peace agreement. And these impartial soldiers, the peacekeepers, would stand by to make sure that the parties respected the agreement's terms. And in order to be truly impartial, they should come from really far away and have no stake in what's going on. And they should avoid ever stepping in. In the 1990s, peacekeepers were deployed to the former Yugoslavia and to Rwanda and stood by as the people of those countries perpetrated and endured truly epic conflagrations. Now, I first spent time in Rwanda when I was an undergraduate uh, 20 years ago. And I remember walking with a Rwandan friend, Gabby, in Kichukiro in the, the Rwandan capital. And he had grown up in Uganda. And he told me about a phone call that he remembered uh, making to his relatives in Rwanda in early 1994, just as the genocide was getting started. And Gabby's parents were trying to convince these relatives that they should really get out as fast as they could. Um, but they assured them, they said, don't worry about us. There are peacekeepers here. It can't get that bad if there are peacekeepers here. And in fact, it got a whole lot worse than that. And in the wake of those disasters, there's been a push both inside the UN and outside of it to make protecting civilians the reason for being for peacekeeping. They should intervene if needed, even if that means being aggressive. That's one big shift. And at the same time, who is doing peacekeeping has also changed. So India, Ethiopia, they're old timers, stalwarts of peacekeeping, but the, the Northern Europeans and the Canadians who did it in the past, they are out. And instead it's soldiers from the global, <coughs> from the global South who have taken their place. And it's a few African countries that have seen the largest increase in peacekeeping participation. Mm -hmm. Rwanda is the best example. Um, the country's name used to be a byword for just how massively peacekeeping could fail. 
And as of last year, Tiny Rwanda was the second largest provider of peacekeeping troops in the world. Um, they're currently number four because one of the missions they contributed to Darfur has closed. Now, Rwanda, I said it's tiny, it's about the size of Maryland, and the military is about 30,000 people. And at any given time, about 5,000 are deployed in peacekeeping missions. And so that means that pretty much any officer you meet has done multiple tours as a peacekeeper. South Sudan, Darfur, and CAR are the main deployment sites. And all of those places are really different from Rwanda, um, and yet geographically also fairly close. So what is it like to be a foot soldier in this humanitarian government? That's the question that has motivated my research. A lot of these Rwandan officers were once insurgents fighting in the shadow of a peacekeeping mission. What do they see as the moral conflicts that arise in peacekeeping, given that now they're the ones who are doing it? These are slightly different questions from the ones that researchers usually ask. Most research on peacekeeping comes out of political science and international relations, and they tend to be interested in things like why countries contribute troops to peacekeeping. Spoiler alert, if you're a poor country, you can make money by doing it. Mm -hmm. And they're interested in establishing causal relationships about peacekeeping. Does it reduce the intensity or duration of armed conflict? Does it reduce the chance of a renewed outbreak of war? The answers to these questions are usually yes, but probably not that much. And it's really difficult to pull apart all the different factors. Then there's a recent turn toward understanding peacekeepers' everyday practices, um, which is sort of like ethnography, but generally without the making the familiar strange part. Now, anthropologists have looked a little bit less at peacekeeping, but we've looked at adjacent topics. Um, 15 years ago, Hugh Gusterson had an annual review article about anthropology and militarism. And he both gave credit to work that had been done so far, ethnographies of armed groups and also explorations of national security and what militarized national security means for people's lives. And he argued that much more work needs to be done. There's also been some excellent recent work looking at the toll, the, looking at the toll that being a soldier in the American military takes on people, often leaving them with physical and emotional scars and disorders and two people whose work uh, has inspired me in this respect are Kenneth McLeish and Jocelyn Chua here at, at UNC. Both of them show that being a soldier in the US today is this sort of strange status of being venerated in certain contexts, you know, early boarding and that kind of thing, but also being exposed to great trauma and really cold bureaucracy and the increasing role of mental health and therapeutic culture and psychoactive drugs on people's experiences of being in the military. Now, incidentally, that mental health framing of soldiering is present in the Rwandan military also. Um, they try to deploy a psychologist in each peacekeeping mission, um, but it's not nearly as present for people as it seems to be in the U.S. military. And I heard things that really surprised me about the effects of um, being involved in a military, being involved in, in violence. Um, one officer who became a close friend, he said to me, I tell young people, don't go into the military if you want to make money, or get rich, go into business. But if you want knowledge, go into the military. I asked him why. He said, well, this is because military training opens the mind. Before you go into the military, you think that to kill someone, you can't even think it. You can't do it. But then through training, you learn to kill someone if it needs to be done. Now, this officer, I should say, is a devoted husband and father, and one of his personal struggles has been to assure a really high quality education for his son who has autism, mm -hmm. while also providing his other children, um, who are all at the top of their classes, all the opportunities that he can. His own education was disrupted. He didn't get to finish secondary school until he was nearly 30 because he spent his youth in the RPF insurgency. So, Back to anthropology and militarism. Um, one of Gusterson's points in that old annual review article was that militarism is kind of under theorized in anthropology. He wrote, militarism like capitalism is a life world with its own escalatory logic that takes different local forms while displaying fundamental underlying unities. Despite these underlying unities, 
local processes of militarization are invariably defended as defensive reactions to someone else's militarism, from which they therefore differ in moral character. One task for anthropological analysis is to unmask such ideological processes of legitimation. As an aside, you see this was published in 2007 and sort of reading it today, it's very clear that this was written in 2007 in the wake of Iraq and Afghanistan and not 2022 in the wake of, of February 24th and what's happening in Ukraine. But in any event, if I were to sort of hazard an attempt to sum up, um, it seems like what anthropologists like Gusterson are saying is that militarism, it's definitely about weapons. Um, those are involved. Um, and it can mean many different things, um, but you know it has these fundamental underlying unities, but those remain kind of unspecified what those are. Um, but it would be very difficult to find an anthropological study saying that militarism is a good thing. And the problem with that is that when you say something is bad, you generally become both less open to it and less curious about it. Well, don't worry, <laughs> I'm not going to say militarism is good either, mm -hmm. um, but I am going to say that militarism is not actually all that meaningful unless it really is broken down into some of its constituent parts. And once you do that, it's not clear <coughs> that reconstituting militarism as a category is the next best step. And I do think that this presumption of badness when it comes to militaries has limited our curiosity. Now, here are four things that I learned about militaries that I didn't know before doing this research. Um, one, militaries, they can be really different from each other. Another is that being a so good soldier can mean a lot of different things, how that gets defined, how that gets understood. Um, a third was that there are a lot of intellectuals in the military. And one of the things that I've enjoyed the most about this research have been the really excellent questions that I've received from the people I've been, been talking with and learning from. And then the fourth was that maybe we've kind of overplayed the weapons part uh, in terms of thinking about what militaries are and, and how they work. Um, there's a former advertising executive turned humor writer entrepreneur named Robert Young Pelton. And he once said that being in the military is 99% boredom and 1% looking for clean underwear. <laughs> and it's not that far off <laughs> actually in some, in some respects. So, Taking these points with us and returning to peacekeepers from Rwanda, what do we find out? You know, my interest has been to understand what do, peace, what do military peacekeepers see as the moral challenges of being told that they should do whatever it takes to protect people, but also that they should never take sides and that they should always follow orders. You know, what do they experience as being hard to swallow or difficult to decide? What I learned is that many of the challenges are about learning to adapt to a bureaucracy that both mistrusts you and is extremely risk averse. Um, in other words, not that different from being a professor in an American university. I'm joking here, but only partly. So two areas of contention um, that my interlocutors have, have brought to my attention that I'll speak about today are relationships with locals and the places where they're working and the imagined perils of taking initiative. So <clears throat> let's head to Rwanda and to these Rwandan peacekeeping bases now. And as a virtual means of travel, I thought that I would play a very short clip from a song by a previously very popular Rwandan officer and musician, Sergeant Robert. He's now a bit disgraced, um, but I still like the song. And the song is a bit long. Um, so what I've done is I've sort of cut out 30 seconds um, of the chorus for us to listen to. So pardon the abrupt both beginning and end to it. Although it's not showing up. So it's possible that we'll have to skip this. Hmm. Strange. They're supposed to be. Oh, there it is. All right. Have any idea where? Nope. That took me too far. If you hover over it, does I hover over? What's going to happen? <laughs> this is always the tricky part about having these presentations. Right. Uh oh. <laughs> what just happened? That was not what I expected. Let's see. Maybe if I do it this way. Nope. 
It's a nice black rectangle anyway. <laughs> Did you attach it in as a clip, shall we say? Or? I just, I no, I, I just um, placed in the, the MP4 file. Oh, I see. But if it's not working, I'm not going to belabor this. Right. It would have been nice, but I can tell you about it. I'm going to do the same thing that I yeah. just did. Okay. Oh, that's a bummer. So anyway. <laughs> It was just, <laughs> that's the reference, right? Yeah, yeah that's, the, that's the song, Jugu Chatu um, by Kamajesh. And um, it's Sergeant Robert, who was an officer in the Rwandan military, um, and, um, and this group. And they would sing these songs that were, um, you know, this song in particular is a, a song about how Africans need to develop Africa and Rwandans can bring their culture and use it to solve these problems. But the reason, the thing I liked about the song is that um, the smiles and the facial expressions that the people have as that Sergeant Robert and his, his colleagues have as they are singing are smiles that just, I really recognize. Um, their facial expressions and sort of a, a, a way of being that I, I recognize from this research that I've been doing. And, uh, you know, I enjoy, I enjoy those residences when I'm not in Rwanda and around the people who I'm doing research with. Now, of course, there were plenty of times when people were not smiling. Um, but I think that, I think that the idea that just being a soldier makes a person kind of toxically masculine, which is the impression that one gets from some corners of the critical security studies world, is pretty unfair to a lot of the individuals uh, who are involved in this. And I think about going to church services on these peacekeeping bases um, and the kind of joy that both women and men would express. It was really striking for someone like me who has learned to live in fear of being marked as naive, as I think many of us in the academy are. And here, some people who are familiar with the, the literature on Rwanda might break in and say, yes, but in Rwanda, people live in fear of their authoritarian government, uh, to which I'll say yes, um, but also no. Um, so let's return to that topic later if you want to. You, know, you can tell that I'm working on a book because there's so many moments when I'm saying, there's a lot more to say about this that I'm happy to talk about. So back to peacekeeping. Um, let me give you a little bit more background about how it is organized because um, people are often surprised um, by this stuff. So Rwanda first deployed peacekeepers to Darfur in 2002, um, which was a decade after the genocide in Rwanda. And it was a time when people were calling what was happening in Darfur itself a genocide. Now Darfur was an African Union mission at that point, but it became a United Nations mission in 2007. Um, and Rwandan soldiers have also been deployed in the UN missions in South Sudan and in the Central African Republic. And in a UN mission, you have civilian staff um, political affairs officers, people like that. You have police officers, you have soldiers, and you have military observers. And I spent time with the soldiers. UN peacekeepers are sometimes referred to as blue helmets in reference to the light blue helmets that they wear. So you might think that these multinational forces are composed of a jumble of soldiers from different countries. And it's true that any UN mission will have personnel from about 50 or so countries, but soldiers from different countries only mix at the level of mission level staff officers. Um, so the mission has a force commander who is in charge of the military side of the mission. And then the force commander has staff officers working with him and they will come from different countries. Um, and then the territory covered by the mission is divided into geographic sectors. And each sector has its own commander and deputies. And then in each um, sector, you have a number of battalions. Um, and in the UN, a battalion is about 800 people. And those battalions come from different countries. And each battalion is a kind of national island unto itself. So they have their own base or they have their own self-contained portion of a larger base. And each battalion has its own hierarchical structure. Um, it's commanded by a Lieutenant Colonel with his usual complement of staff officers. Now, Rwandan soldiers have been told by their leadership that their purpose, their reason for being peacekeepers is to protect civilians. But what do they actually do on a daily basis? Well, one thing that they do is um, what are called static guards. These are watchtowers or other posts where they sit for maybe 12 hours at a time to keep, out, uh, keep an eye on everything that's going on around them. 
Another thing they do are patrols. And patrols can vary in duration from an hour, you know, very short, uh, to several days um, and distance covered. And they also vary in terms of how they're carried carried out, whether they're carried out on foot, just walking around in a neighborhood or in vehicles. And then they have different purposes, um, you know, to learn about what's going on, to build confidence, as the jargon puts it, um, by making people feel like the soldiers are around and present. Um, another thing that the peacekeepers do is they spend a lot of time protecting uh, UN installations, um, the base, the stock houses, um, and uh, protecting the UN convoys. You know, to have UN personnel out in remote parts of a place like the Central African Republic requires immense logistical capacity. Um, the Rwandan battalion posted to Bria, which is in the sort of north center of the CAR, uh, has they alone have four giant refrigerator trucks um, that they try to drive on these terrible roads um, to be able to bring frozen foods um, in for them. And these convoys of trucks have to drive very slowly and they're enormous and they're full of valuable stuff. And so they're very easy to ambush. Um, and so escorting these convoys is a huge part of what the peacekeepers do. Um, that same friend of mine who spoke about how being in the military it opens your mind, um, his job as a peacekeeper was that he would organize these convoys of 200 trucks at a time from Port Sudan to Darfur. The peacekeepers, <clears throat> they also have to maintain their own equipment um, and themselves. That takes a lot of time and effort. And it turns out that protect civilians is not really linked to any particular military practice or technique. And protect civilians is very diffused by the process through which peacekeepers receive orders. Um, so the idea that the concept of civilian protection has really transformed what peace, peacekeepers do is pretty overstated. And this is true even for the Rwandans and the Rwandan military has really made a big statement about how civilian protection is what is really important to them. It's important to the leadership and it's also important to a lot of the rank and file in terms of how they understand themselves and how they think about what they're doing and the value of what they're doing. This idea that they are doing things differently from how peacekeepers um, did things in the past and that they're doing it better. Um, but they're very stuck between wanting to be good students who learn all of the rules and follow them better than anyone else and wanting to be good teachers, you know, showing people a new and better way of doing things. And it's often that good student role that wins out. It's a much safer stance to take for many different reasons. Now, the soldiers' critiques, um, some of the nodes of concern about how to become teachers and not students center on a few issues. And I'll just talk about two of them today. One is relationships with locals, and the other is the status of initiative, taking initiative as a value in the military and in the UN in particular. Now on relationships, this has really changed. Um, peacekeepers from 15, 10, and even five years ago, described relationships with people in the places where they were deployed as the most meaningful thing about peacekeeping and as absolutely essential to doing this work well. Um, more recently, the peacekeepers almost never interact with any locals. Um, when I met the first Rwandan battalion commander in Bengi at the end of 2014, he said that the reason that he was able to be successful in protecting people was that he had gotten to know all of the armed group leaders and government officials. And he would invite them over to the base uh, for drinks and be soda for the Muslims and beer for the Christians. Um, and they would chat and get to know each other. And then when these armed group members did things like put up a roadblock, he would call them up and say, <laughs> take it down within an hour or we will come and destroy it. Um, and they did. A few years later, when I visited, the battalion commander knew none of the armed group leaders, had no idea how to reach them, and there were roadblocks all over the city's most contested neighborhoods. Another friend who was an officer serving in Darfur and South Sudan for five of the last 15 years um, at different, different points, he still speaks regularly on the phone with the generals and civil society leaders who became his close friends while he was there. And he actually also said quite proudly that he, on a number of occasions, broke the rules by helping um, these friends of his. 
And as he put it, he said, to be human, to be a person, I had to, I had to break the rules. And he thought he could do this in a way that was uh, not going to, was only going to, um, only going to uh, make their the mission of, of protecting people sort of easier to, to achieve. But he was working in the UN and the UN deeply mistrusts the soldiers who comprise the bulk of their forces. Um, I completed the two month peacekeeper training course in Rwanda. And on one of the first days, there was an American um, staffer from UNICEF, the UN Children's Organization. She came and gave a presentation. And her first slide read, do not harm children. <laughs> I found this kind of stunning. <laughs> She seemed to think that this was something that she needed to teach. And, you know, most of the people in the room were fathers and a few of them were mothers. Um, but to be fair, there have been far too many incidents of soldiers taking sexual advantage of people, including children, in the places where they are deployed. It doesn't make it any better, um, but actually the civilian staff have higher rates of perpetrating um, sexual exploitation and abuse than the soldiers do. But putting that to the side, now, whenever a case comes to light, it gets picked up on in the news and it becomes an international scandal. And there were several of these in the Central African Republic. And the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. said, if there is so much as one more case of sexual exploitation by a peacekeeper, we will pull all funding for this mission. And the U.S. is the major funder um, for the mission. So the force commander issued what was called a non-fraternization policy. No soldier should have any contact with any local except in extremely restricted and choreographed ways. And while that was intended as a drastic measure in a dire situation, it's become pretty much the standard policy. Um, now each battalion has someone whose title is MLO, Military Liaison Officer. And that's the one person who is tasked with communicating with local leaders and any sort of local people. Um, apparently this MLO um, thing was, um, it was a practice that the US military developed in Afghanistan. And actually a lot of US military practices sort of seep over into peacekeeping, even though the US military officially generally stays really far away from, from peacekeeping missions. So the result, you know, you might think that the longer a peacekeeping mission is deployed, the more knowledgeable the staffers become about the place and dynamics there. And in fact, the opposite has happened. They become more walled off, more disconnected over time. Uh, and the soldiers who speak at length with me are often frustrated by that, but the UN puts a lot of effort into improving the material conditions of the peacekeepers. So it's also easy to just go to the gym and watch a movie and chat on WhatsApp with family at home and prepare for the big parade and count down to repatriation, um, even for people who think of themselves as doing peacekeeping differently and better. And then there's the question of initiative. Um, which requires understanding how soldiers receive orders. So the force commander and the sector commanders are the ones who issue the task orders, outlining what the battalions should be doing. So for instance, they will tell them how many patrols to do and in which places. And if you wanna do anything off your base whatsoever, you need to have a task order. Um, and it was a young Rwandan officer posted to Malakal in South Sudan who clued me into this issue of task orders. His job was logistics. Um, so he said he's never bored. It turns out that logistics is where a lot of the real intellectuals and problem solvers in the military end up um, because there's just so much to try to figure out. And he critiqued, he critiqued the UN. He said, the problem with the UN is that there's no initiative. You're punished for taking initiative. This is just my opinion, I'm not speaking for anyone. But to me, it seems like not that much has changed since 1994 with that Canadian Colonel. What was his name? I interjected, Dallaire. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dallaire. You know, you know, in the Rwandan military, you're told what to do, but not how to do it. Now this idea, you're told what to do, but not how to do it, this is the idea of mission command. And mission command is the idea that people operating at the tactical level should have a lot of autonomy. The ones who are there on the ground who know best how to do it, who know what should be done. So just give them the autonomy to figure it out. And that's the best way to do things. But in the UN, you're told both what to do and how to do it. 
So for instance, if you get tasked to drive along a certain road to a given location, and you're told to drive in the clockwise direction here on the base perimeter, for instance, and then it turns out that there's a blockage on that road in that direction, you have to come home without achieving your task. If you did that in the Rwandan military, they would say, you are an idiot, <laughs> because of course you just drive the other way and get to the place that you need to, but not in the UN. If you do anything other than what you're tasked with and you're in the UN, it's a problem. There will be a board of inquiry. At this point, I interjected that, of course, if you stand by while people get hurt, there will also be a board of inquiry. And he agreed, but he said that this system, quote, it makes it really hard to respond quickly and effectively. If someone is getting killed in front of you, how long does that take? Not long, but you, but you have to first report what you see and then get a task order before you can do anything. It can take a really long time. And in the meantime, people are suffering and dying. He's right. If a peacekeeper sees something, his obligation is to report up the chain of command all the way to the force commander. And then the task order will travel back down the chain of command to him. And it doesn't always take a long time, but it certainly can. So in this push to make civilian protection an important part of peacekeeping, um, a lot of people have seen and thought that UN mandates are the linchpin to doing more to protect civilians. Change the mandate, change the sort of the big language about what peacekeepers are supposed to do, and that will have a big effect. But actually the sticking point lies elsewhere. It's in this process of how orders get issued um, and the displacement and discouragement of initiative on the part of the peacekeepers. And I can give more examples of this um, in the Q&A. Now, being a peacekeeper is what Ralph Linton called an achieved status, and it carries with it a role sort of expected and appropriate behaviors. And there are things about the hierarchies and bureaucracies that the status role of peacekeeping is embedded in that really tamp down on virtue ethics as a guide to action. <coughs> now, I said earlier that militarism should be broken down into constituent parts, and that once that is done, it's not clear that reconstituting the category, that category is the most useful way to proceed. So what are those constituent parts? Well, here are a few that, um, uh, here are a few that I'm sure are on the list, and there are a few more that I'm still mulling, so haven't listed yet. One is hierarchy. Um, and hierarchy is different from stratification, um, because in both cases, and when you're talking about hierarchy or when you're talking about stratification, you're talking about a situation where people are not equal. Um, but in a stratified situation, there's no concept of a whole. Um, when you're talking about hierarchy, you're talking about an organization, an institution, a situation where the people within that institution are not equal, <coughs> but they are all necessary for the functioning of that whole. So you can see how a military in this sense is sort of like this, where you have somebody who's a private, you have somebody who's a general, their roles, their positions are very different, but you couldn't have a military either without privates or without generals. They're all kind of needed. So it's an inequality, but inequality within some sort of sense of a whole. Um, and so when you're talking about a situation that is hierarchical, then statuses and roles um, are delineated in relation to that whole. And so that ends up becoming an extra level of justification <laughs> or elaboration around why there's rigidity for what that role is and what the limits of what one person can do. Then another factor that I'm sure is in there is bureaucracy, um, but this varies. Uh, you know, we were just talking about mission command. Um, in some militaries where there's a strong doctrine of mission command, that bureaucratic aspect of rules and procedures and following them always much more muted. In the UN, you have national militaries that are themselves embedded within this UN um, bureaucracy. And so it becomes a very heavy kind of many layers of rules and procedures and policies that you need to follow. Um, and even, you know, another aspect of bureaucracy is all of these acronyms and abbreviations and terms of art to such an extent that it almost becomes its own language. And you really can't understand it unless you've been sort of schooled in it. Then a third element here is that militarism 
what we're talking about here, we're talking about a capacity for collective force. We're talking about organizing people so that they know how to cooperate to be able to use force in coordination with each other. And that's a very specialized kind of a thing. And it's linked to these other aspects of hierarchy and each person kind of knowing their, their place. Now, I'm curious, and I'd love to hear from you in the, the Q&A, what else you think goes into this sort of the constituent parts of militarism, what I've left out, what you might want to tweak, um, what, else, what else should be put in there. The reason that I think we should pause before necessarily sort of rushing into putting these pieces together into one overarching category is that when we break things down like this, we might see some new comparisons, um, some new similarities. Now, when I started doing this research, I was working toward tenure um, at my university. And so I knew a bit about what it was like to work in a hierarchy because universities are pretty hierarchical too. And I saw those similarities and I understood uh, when soldiers were hesitant to speak about their bosses <laughs> or were careful to couch their challenges as actually strengths, things that they could do. Um, I also recognized a spark of ambition in a lot of young officers. You know, they were going to, they were going to go places and they saw a path that they were trying to take. Now, I came to this topic of peacekeeping um, because I had spent a lot of time listening to Central Africans complain about how useless or downright nefarious um, the peacekeepers were. So I wanted to know what things looked like from the other side of the wall and not for the civilian peacekeepers, but for the soldiers. Um, and like I said, many of these peacekeepers I got to know were caught between wanting to be good students and wanting to be good teachers. And when those statuses come into conflict, they've generally erred on the side of being good students. Um, but that is definitely changing and in ways that are still developing. So I'll leave it there and thank you. Look forward to your questions. It was advertised that this is a conversation. <laughs> and so we, I think, ought to make it a conversation. <laughs> Please. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to field questions, but I think given that it's quite a small group, um, I know we have folks online, um, feel free to just raise your hand and, um, and ask away. Charlie. Um, sorry, I got here late, so I made my is. questions to answer um, before, but um, can you say a little bit more about why the distancing from the civilian population? Why, um, you know, what was behind that injunction? It seems strange. It's just getting too messy um, between soldiers and locals. Um, you would think that that's where all the intel comes from, and that's where good relations are generated. Yeah, so it, it's a few different sources. One source is um, the fear of, of some kind of, of sexual relationships um, developing between peacekeepers and people in the places where they're deployed. And that fear is really because that any kind of relationship like that is prohibited. Um, and so that becomes, if, if it ever happens, then that can become very scandalous for the mission. And so they're really doing whatever they can to prevent something like that from happening. But it's also just part of, you know, these, these peacekeepers, they think of themselves as being professional. It's really important to professionalism, being professional. And an element of being professional is that you have this distance between the soldiers and anybody else. Um, and actually, in some of the early years, you go back to when the it's now a UN mission in the Central African Republic, but when it was an African Union mission, um, you had some peacekeepers from Cameroon right next door. And they were deployed to the part of Central African Republic that's right by Cameroon, so they were just across the border. Um, and they opened a bar. <laughs> and everyone loved this in the town that, where they were because they were able to access um, bottled beer in a way that other people weren't, and they had low prices. And the soldiers would actually use this as a way to generate revenue so that they could, if you know somebody in their contingent got injured, they could send him home, or if he needed to go home to like visit a family member. So it, it worked really well, and people felt really protected because one of the main ways that a lot of Central Africans, like an idiom that they use to speak about, do we feel safe, do we feel protected, is can we go out at night? Mm. And when there was this peacekeeper bar there, they could. Um, but then it shifted to become a UN mission and you got these new people coming in and um, being very patronizing about 
ah, these Africans and they think that it's acceptable to be running a bar um, as peacekeepers. And so they shut it down. And in the process, they also said, and you have to build a base where you have a wall around you because that's the proper way for peacekeepers to be. So one of the things that I think doesn't get sufficiently noted about peacekeeping missions is that they really have a life course. And when they first get deployed, they're in this startup mode. And um, actually, a lot of the people living around these peacekeepers, they actually really like them when they're in that startup mode because they're living much closer to people. They're eating together with people. They're eating local food. They're going out and about all of these kinds of things. And then over time, just the force of the bureaucracy, the force of the UN, its values, its expectations about what is inherently better is that it is inherently better to have a larger material footprint, a larger wall to be more closed off. And so they'll come in and build these bases and they build them five kilometers outside of town. Like, well, how are you going to protect people then? Um, but their idea is that they need to be completely separate. Um, and so it's, it has, has to, I think it's just an inherent kind of bias and logic within the UN that is then made even worse by this fear of the soldiers. And you know, one, more, one more point, and then I'll, I'll stop blabbering here, but uh, a lot of research on these peacekeeping missions kind of lumps everybody together. So they'll talk about the peacekeeping mission, but there are actually some really important differences between say the civilian staff and the soldiers. And in particular, one big difference is that the civilian staff really look down on the soldiers. Um, see them as being kind of um, a problem in a lot of ways and unmanageable and difficult. Um, and so it's the civilian staff who get to determine things like where the base is going to be located. And they have these sort of biases about um, these often African men who are, are soldiers. Yeah, if I could just follow up for a sec. Um, not to, not to guess, but... Um, it reminds me of the U.S. Embassy in, uh, you know, that I know well in Togo. Yeah. Um, where um, whenever I want to meet with people in the embassy and I've done some photography there, um, it's either on their grounds or in a restaurant in a gated community. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. they'll never go into the street side bars, you know, where the tiki bars where I eat every day. Mm -hmm. um, and they've sort of, they, they, you know, they get that instruction from the ambassador. Yep. Um, and then another aspect of this maybe is that I've always been um, struck by the fact that the uh, U.S. Embassy, embassy officials come and go. I mean, it's like two years is the, is, is the standard term, and then they're on to the next. And I've asked about that, and what people have always said is that the State Department has an explicit policy uh, that they don't want State Department officials to go native, to go local, because they are to represent our interests, mm -hmm. not local interests. The longer they stay there, the more they become like anthropologists. Okay, and they yep. sympathize with the locals, and they represent local politics. Anyway, so it may be part of a much larger, you know, sort of... It it definitely is. And I, I think the U.S. Embassy is even worse in some ways. You know, I remember being in Bangui a few years ago and I was going to meet with somebody from the U.S. Embassy. And uh, I said, just come over to the apartment where I'm staying because that'll be that'll be easier. And they sent these big like these giant dudes <laughs> over ahead of time to sort of sweep the apartment and make sure that everything was OK. And then for the entire time that we chatted, these big like I'm saying big because I mean, they seemed like they were seven feet tall and like 300 pounds. <laughs> these guys were sitting in the uh, in the parking lot downstairs just to to provide this kind of security. Um, but I mean, part of what is has been interesting for me then is to see what it's like for these Rwandan soldiers to become acculturated into this kind of UN way of thinking about things. And um, in some ways for many of them, it's actually not that hard because they're there to do a job, they'll do the job that's enough, then they'll, they'll go home. And like I said, you know, they, um, when I was last in, in Bangui last year, they were doing the inspection of the, of the base and um, these Rwandan soldiers, they got chastised a bit because they did not have enough gym equipment <laughs> um, and the deep fryer wasn't working properly. But, you know, so they have a lot of stuff on their base and they can kind of get used to that. But they also express that it can be very difficult to get into the, it's very strange to them, the sort of way of thinking and this idea that they have huge amounts of food and there are all these people outside the base who are hungry and they can't give it to them. That seems kind of strange. Um, and even things like uh, one of the big complaints is that they have to eat this food that is being shipped in from who knows where. Um, and a lot of these soldiers, before they've 
until they've done peacekeeping, they've never had refrigerated or frozen food be their primary diet. Um, and all of a sudden, that's what it is. It's all sort of preserved foods um, that can be shipped out to this remote part of, of Central Africa. And they describe it as leading to all sorts of health problems. Um, yeah. Could you talk about more of like, how the civilians like, reacted or just interact with the peacekeepers? I'm interested to see like, what they think of the peacekeepers, especially like, before like, when they could react and they could talk well or, like, at the bar versus now when it's more of like they're secluded. Yeah, so the opinions vary quite a lot, um, but just speaking very generally, I think it's fair to say, and I can say this across um, different places where there are big peacekeeping missions, for the most part, the people living in the, the places where these missions are deployed think that the peacekeepers are there to make money. Um, they aren't doing very much um, other than sort of enriching themselves. Uh, and that varies, it does vary because sometimes there are peacekeepers who um, will make more of an effort to try to get to know people and to try to do the things that people feel are most valuable. Um, but there is often a really important disconnect between what people living in these places think of as the most valuable things that peacekeepers could be doing and what the peacekeepers um, policies and procedures say that they should be doing. Um, and the peacekeepers who end up being the most appreciated are the ones who do things that are not within the, the policies and procedures. So things like running this bar. Um, but another one was that in South Sudan, there's a Mongolian battalion um, that got mountain bikes and would do all of their patrols on mountain bike. And you can be absolutely sure that nobody in the UN ever said to them, do a mountain bike patrol, but they thought, hey, this is the terrain seems like it would be good for mountain biking, so let's do that. Um, and that getting out of their big vehicles and just getting a little bit closer to people was something that, that people really appreciated. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's the, the, the general sense with some variation. Yes, please. Did you ever get any peacekeepers complaining about not receiving a salary on time? Mm -hmm. The reason why I ask you this is that there are certain operations where peacekeepers, peacekeepers don't receive the money on time. Not because the money is in China, but because most of the funds are raised in the global north and the people who are the master in the global south. Yes. So governments from the global north channel have money to be issued. So, um, not so much. My sense is that, so the, it's true. I mentioned at the beginning that, um, countries sort of lower GDP countries can make some money off of peacekeeping because the UN will pay you about $1,500 per month per soldier who's deployed in one of these missions, which is more than the Ministry of Defense in Rwanda, for instance, has for each of their soldiers. So that extra money then, does it all go to the soldiers or does it all go to the Ministry of Defense? In Rwanda, a lot of it goes to the soldiers. So they know that by being deployed, they will get more money, but it gets paid into their bank account in Bangui. There's a military bank and they have accounts in it. They give you know good loans so that people can buy houses, which is one of the main things that people do with the money that they make from peacekeeping is buy land, build a house. Um, and so mostly people are not touching that money until they get back. I haven't heard from people that the money was not getting um, dispersed to them, but you're absolutely right that this is a problem and there's often a delay. Um, and this is one of the reasons why countries that are contributing peacekeeping soldiers, they have to kind of build up the capacity to do this so that they can um, handle it if there's a delay in the money getting, getting sent to them. And I think it varies quite a bit from one country to another how much of this extra money actually goes to the soldiers who are doing the work. But the money is not being sent from countries from the global north to countries to the global south. It goes through the UN peacekeeping and they send out the money to, to the countries in any event. So it's a problem at the level of the southern countries, whether they <laughs> pass the money on or not. So the question is not that for some sort of discrimination, uh, Western countries would not send the money to 
Indian peacekeepers, the money goes out. The question is whether it reaches the contingent. Right. Very often contingents come home and complain about not receiving the money while they were deployed, or it's not even there when they come mm. back. You see. But there are often delays in, you know, in money getting paid to the UN. There's many steps in the process. Um, so it can it can get it can get complicated. But it was something that you could really see. You know, I first started doing this research in Rwanda in 2017, and the base where the peacekeeping training happens was already a very nice base with classrooms and everything. And over the last several years, you see all these new buildings going up. Um, and this is and and spiffier uniforms and they have you know combat uniforms and they have sports uniforms and they have boots and they have all of the gear that they need to have to feel like they're you know doing this job as professionally as mm -hmm. as possible so a lot of this the money that they're they're making is going both to the soldiers and into these bases and you can just really see it mm -hmm. um in the the physical infrastructure okay thank you very much That's yeah. i was in the region no, no, no problem. Uh, the second question I have is Do you think there's going to be a change in the mandate as given? I mean, the reason why I ask this is that given the mandate to just protect the people, the 2010 file that I had. In the ERC in 2018, the M23 was created because the UN was given a set of Do you think that's going to be replicated in Central America? No. I don't. And the reason for that is that um, now these peacekeeping missions are part of a com complex um, arrangement of different armed actors um, in these places. So in the Central African Republic right now, we have a large UN peacekeeping mission. Um, we also have, and this has never been seen before, I didn't really have time to talk about it today, but topic for another Another, another day, um, you also have a, a battalion of Rwandan soldiers who are deployed bilaterally to the Central African Republic. So you have Rwandans who are there as part of the peacekeeping mission. You have Rwandans who are there as part of a kind of mission to support the Central African government. They are a few kilometers away from each other in Bangui. Um, they know each other. <laughs> so they are there. Um, and then you also have um, Wagner Group mercenaries um, who are from many different countries, some of them from Russia, but also from Syria, Libya, you know, many different places, and they are there. And what ended up happening in the Central African Republic was that they've been in, they've been stuck in this situation where they have an elected government, um, but there are very powerful armed groups that are still operating in the country. And two years ago, just about two years ago, there was a rebel, um, coalition that was trying to take capital take take power in the capital and was coming very close and the un was kind of sitting back wasn't the un mission wasn't doing very much um, and the central african government instead turned to their friends um, of rwanda and russia um, and got help from them to push this insurgency back and they did so um, and that has made it that has has made it even like the, the UN mission in the country is in this very difficult situation now where they've kind of allowed a huge part of what they were supposed to be doing to be taken over by these other actors. Um, and they're mostly sort of frustrated by this, but um, it also means that they're, they're not going to be the ones to, at this point, they're not going to be the ones to step in and take a stronger stance in one way or another. I also think that just the question of mandates is sort of um, uh, misleading. Uh, and my reason for saying this is there's a, a, a great, there's a, um, a Swedish scholar named Tony Ingesen who wrote um, a dissertation about um, culture in the military. And one of his examples was from the UN mission in Yugoslavia in the 1990s. And um, he pointed out that there were these two battalions that were deployed next to each other in that mission. One was from Holland and the other was from Sweden. And uh, they're in the same sector, the same kinds of dynamics that they were dealing with. They had the same mandate. Um, but the Swedish battalion and the Swedish military, they have this very strong doctrine of mission command, of just autonomy for people who are out there doing this work of soldiering. And the commander of that battalion was really had a very strong sense of purpose as my purpose is to protect people here. I'm going to do whatever it takes. And he did. 
and he broke every rule, <laughs> um, but he really did a lot to protect people in that area. Um, and he ended up not being able to pursue a military career later on because he just alienated too many of his superiors. Although the UN did claim credit for all the good work that was done in that sector um, afterwards. In contrast, in the Dutch battalion right next door, they were not sure that they wanted to get to know the locals at all. The Swedes had been very, you know, interested in talking with them and finding out what was going on. The Dutch had a lot of, seemed to have a lot of prejudices about people there and followed what they saw as following the mandate to the letter, um, which was to not intervene at all. And they were there for Srebrenica <coughs> and all of the people were massacred. It was the same mandate in both of those cases. Um, and the Swedish commander said, the mandate says it's my job to do what it takes to protect people. And the Dutch commander said, uh, it's my job to be careful and not really do too much. So I think that the mandate is kind of the wrong place to look for change to happen. And instead it has to do with something about the, you know, the, the culture of the battalion and whether they're willing to um, break rules and take initiative um, or not. And then you'd have to have an additional layer of of conversation about whether that even is really the best thing for them to be doing um, or not. May I? Please, um, I've been waiting for it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a little bit difficult because there's so much in what you said that would be interesting to discuss, but there's some, you know, obviously you're very conscious of that. There is something really standing in the room that is not addressed. Mm -hmm. Here you do have Rwandan peacekeeping soldiers uh, it would be interesting to know why they go into peacekeeping like the Chinese do among mm -hmm. the bigger powers and why Western countries don't do it any longer. Is it a question of mercenary? Is it a mercenary? Is it about, I mean, the Rwandans also work for the French in Central African Republic, in Mozambique. So yep. uh, they are now guns to, uh, to hire. Uh, so if the French don't want to be uh, in Mozambique and defend their uh, interests for their oil company, they would you know, have a deal with Kagame and he sends his soldiers in. So there are many, many aspects and many of the things that you said would be really interesting, like, uh, you know, what goes into militarism? Is it bureaucracy, institution? My experience with military is that they mostly plan. So if I had to reformulate what military really do, and if you look at our own uh, state, uh, the only strategic foresight that is still done is done by the military because they have these procurement uh, obligations. They need to know what they have to purchase over the next 20 years. So they're looking far ahead and that makes them very unique in, in, in any state and especially in democracies where long-term pl planning is not really uh, the highest priority given the elections and cycles. But the big thing that is really in the room, the UN carried out an investigation and uh, the Rwandan army is accused of having committed uh, crimes against humanity. And there is this very strange formulation sort of bordering on genocide, acts of genocide. So you would not use the G word and would just break it down into acts of genocide, killing 200,000 people in the east of the DRC. The Rwandan army is also accused, and it's very, you know, the opening statement, we run our defense budget on a shoestring. They actually ran it for 10 years on the looting of the raw materials uh, of the Eastern DRC. And that went directly into, that was the defense uh, ministry's budget came out of the raw materials of uh, the Eastern part of the DRC. So here is a situation where the most murderous regime that I know in Africa, which is Rwanda, on record having killed 200,000 people, and you can easily add 100,000 Hutus uh, inside Rwanda, is keeping peace and asking itself, will I be a good, uh, you know, a good student or a good teacher? And it all seems a little bit, you know, surreal, 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 you know. Here you have probably the army in Africa that has killed most, and not only Hutus. Uh, if you look at books like Mikel Rung's uh, Do Not Disturb, uh, Tutsis who are dissidents get killed in South Africa. The Mozambican deployment uh, serves now as you know a, a new basis to uh, kill opponents in in South Africa. So you have a context that makes all that very you know strange. They do a very good job. They're usually much better than many of uh, African contingents. And don't think I'm you know. Uh, overexcited about uh, accusing Kagame and Rwanda. I am not. This is just a uh, fact and you can, can look it up. Uh, and 
discussing the role of Rwandan soldiers, peacekeeping soldiers in a context where they are supposed to protect civilians, which UN peacekeepers hardly ever do. I think you mentioned that quite a bit. If you look at the, uh, the long-term missions in the DRC, all this is to say that we run into a lot of contradictions and all this is a little bit of a very strange echo chamber where would, we would discuss details why we have the, you know, the best peacekeep, African peacekeeping force is actually coming from the hardest dictatorship and the, the army that over the past 30 years, 28 years since the genocide has killed most civilians. Uh, so I just wanted to address that. Obviously, that changes the conversation quite a bit. Hmm. Yeah, thanks for putting those points out there. I sort of, I, I opened the space for them, um, but yeah. didn't quite have time to get into all of them. Now you put a lot on the table. Um, the first thing was about uh, sort of um, why Rwanda might be involved in peacekeeping. That's another of the topics that the political scientists are interested in. And there are a bunch of different reasons. And one is that now they're, you know, the, the budget of the Ministry of Defense is funded by peacekeeping, <laughs> which I think we can agree is better than having it be funded by anything going on in the DRC, uh, even if the peacekeepers aren't, aren't doing as much. Now, the, you know, the UN report, that's a contentious report, um, but, you know, but, but, yeah, and this is this is one of the, I mean, it's one of the difficult things to be honest. You know, it's it's a I think that looking at something like, um, well, just a, trying to study Rwanda today is a little bit of a Rorschach test. Uh, and if you go back to just for instance, you go back to the 1990s. There's a, a military magazine that was published in Gabo magazine in the 1990s in Rwanda. And you read some of the articles in there, and already at that time, um, this Rwandan military was talking about how the role of the military should be not just to fight wars, um, not just to be involved with guns, but also to be building roads and building schools and be involved in every aspect of, of life um, in the country. And you can look at that statement and you can say, oh, well, that's great. It's nice for the military to not be just killing people, to see its role as something more constructive. Or you can look at that article and you can say, look, the military is getting its tentacles into every aspect of social life in this place. Um, and so you have the same kind of, um, you know, the same sort of set of um, same observer, same set of data or set, same set of observations, but you can look at it and see two very different things. Um, and that's something that uh, you know, I've been thinking about um, been thinking of, about a lot with this, and you know, I've also I've some of the soldiers who I got to know, some of them have talked about time that they spent in in Congo, um, and it's quite affecting actually. I mean, not to, I can, they shouldn't have been there, um, but for some of the more rank and file type people who ended up there, it was an incredibly um, difficult experience, um, and people were doing things like uh you know shooting themselves in the arm or leg in the hopes that that might get them um evacuated um, back to rwanda um because it was a you know for the again for more of the rank and file they got into a situation that they really should not have been in and that was um was a very difficult one so um yeah it's i i don't have a a, a clear answer to all of this but you're right it's it's a um it's both a military it's a it's sort of a military that is very professional um when for instance in bangi uh, two years ago when they were trying to push back this rebel assault on the capital they did all the things that you're supposed to do in terms of making a civilian um corridor so that people could evacuate the city they got the cell phone numbers of a lot of people who were evacuating so that they could call them up afterwards and tell them when it was safe to come back in uh, and then there's um, this other history um, that's part of this. Do we have a question from folks online or a comment? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. I think it is counterproductive. 
Um, but for all these reasons, it's becoming an harder, harder and harder um, for those um, just interactions to take place. Louisa, uh, thank you so much for the talk. I think you know, one of the things I really appreciated was the way you kind of got us out of the realm of isms and down into the world of human beings. Um, and I was going to introduce a, a couple of comparative historical categories into the mm -hmm. conversation, one of which was mercenaries, which just came up mm -hmm. to the juxtaposition with peacekeepers. The other one that's interesting, and I wanted you to talk a little bit more about what is motivating the individuals, the peacekeepers. I mean, obviously, they have these contradictions in mind, they embodied them in many ways. And I was thinking, like, okay, are, they, are peacekeepers mercenaries of peace? I'm like, that sounds kind of biblical. Uh, and then, so the other category I wanted to kind of inject in the conversation is missionaries. Um, I mean, what is, or is there an aspect of like, we are doing good, we are making events for previous wrongs? What's driving the individuals to go do this? Is it just the money or is there something else? Yeah, those are great questions. So, I mean, what's driving them to do it? Well, they are in the military, so they get told <laughs> to go and do it. That's a part of things. Um, and uh, But there is also this sense that, um, you know, it's an opportunity to get out into the world, um, to do something that is important. Um, you know, we can be cynical about it in some ways sitting here in this room, but mm -hmm. they they see it as an, as an honor. You know, I spoke with one one friend of mine who was an officer and he was posted to Darfur in 2006 to seven. So he was there when it shifted from being an AU mission to a UN mission. And he said it was the proudest moment of his whole career when he stood there and the UN flag was lifted and he knew that he was part of this now. Um, so, so those are, are some of the, the um, you know, some of the things that go into it. And the soldiers are very, um, they do appreciate the extra money they get, absolutely, but they also are very um, touchy about that aspect of it because they will say, look, people look, say to us that we're doing this for the money, but we make nothing compared to what the civilian staff make, and it's true. Um, I mentioned these soldiers are getting, well, their countries are getting $1,500 a month. Civilian staff, the lowest paid civilian staff in a UN mission that's going to make over $100,000 a year um, easily. Uh, tax free. Um, so the people who are, you know, from from the soldiers perspective, they say, well, we can always go back to our country and we have our job that we go back to. It's not, it's no, it's fine with us either way. It's the other humanitarians who are the ones who really need this mission to stay, to keep going um, because they don't have anything back in the places where they come from. But this point about missionaries is a really good one uh, because I think there are a lot of parallels um, <coughs> in terms of what they're doing. And it, especially in terms of the fact that this experience is much more, um, it's much more an experience or it, it does much more for the people who are, for the peacekeepers than it does for the people in the places where they're working. And with these Rwandan peacekeepers, they have all of these initiatives that they do, um, like teaching people how to compost um, and have kitchen gardens and all of these kinds of things. And it lasts for one morning <laughs> and it feels really nice to the Rwandans who are doing it and the people living in these places, they can kind of go along with it, I guess. Um, but it never, they never keep it going. Um, and so there's a way that even though these are peacekeepers who are coming from, you know, two countries over, um, you know, so not so far away, they slide into this role of being a peacekeeper, of being a missionary, of being a development worker, reproducing all of the same kinds of problems that we've long noted with those lines of work. So there seems to be something about that role that encourages people to get into the position of being the, um, you know, of, of, of um, of sort of being this, this sort of know-it-all um, and and giving people things for their own good, but that they don't actually take up very, very much. Um, that same officer who was in Darfur and was so proud when the UN flag was raised, he ended up writing a master's thesis um, about uh, the uh, Rwandan effort to introduce improved cook stoves in Darfur, which was one of their peacekeeping initiatives. These Rondoreza stoves that were going to make it so that women wouldn't have to go out and collect firewood and all of this stuff. And, you know, what did he find out? He found out oh, people didn't really, they didn't like the stoves very much. They didn't really work very well for them. Um, but there were these improved cook stoves still get trotted out as an example, both in the Rwandan Ministry of Defense and also in the UN more generally as an example of the wonderful things that peacekeepers um, can do. Questions, reflections. The first piggybacks off um, the gentleman's questions about these long divides that have existed between these are sort of 
old categories now, but the global north and the global south. And so much of uh, what I've read of the manuscript so far signals to me very much an African story. Um, and I think we often sort of look at these missions as the outside in, but there, there, there's so many intra-Africa conversations that are happening here as well, right? Rwandans in the CAR, Rwandans in Mozambique. And I wonder if you could um, reflect with us a little bit, um, you know, what it is like for that peacekeeper who sits and observes for 12 hours a day. You know, what are, what are some of those sort of everyday things that are happening, right? And how, how does that sort of feed into these broader logics of, you know, moral making and meaning making? That's the sort of first reflection. Um, and the second, um, I know that we've spoken about this, Louisa, in, in other conversations, um, leads to this sort of conversation around intergenerationality um, in, in the military itself, mm -hmm. given that there is quite an active um, apparatus in Rwanda um, to um, encourage people to become peacekeepers. And so I wonder, you know, with this post-genocide generation, and I'm using sort of, you know, open categories here, right? Mm -hmm. um, how, how, is that, um, how is that work, how is that labor um, sort of pitched to young people um, in a country where employment, for example, is um, a challenge for a lot of young people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in terms of the experiences of the peacekeepers, like on watch posts or other places, um, it's sort of two things at once, mm -hmm. um, because there can be sort of moments of connection or moments of feeling <coughs> like, um, you know, just in, in, they don't do this as much anymore, but when they were able to greet people, yeah. <laughs> sort of, you know, giving hugs, giving greetings, that kind of thing, where it was a moment of, you know, some kind of at least a, 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 a limited kind of connection, but I know a lot of what they notice when they're on these watch watch posts is um, things like, oh my goodness, people here, do you see how they're selling medicine? It's like somebody who has a big basket on his head full of pills and then people are buying those and using that. They don't have a pharmacy to go to. So it's these sort of reflections of, um, you know, they end up, you know, and sometimes they'll say things like, you know, I'm really glad that I had this experience because now I see that even though my country has problems, it's like it doesn't have problems as big as people here have to deal with. Um, so I'm glad that I get to go home. Um, so there's a kind of contrast uh, and um, that they think makes their own country look good. Uh, and that gets back to the same point about how there are these possibilities for some kind of connection um, but there's also something about the role that they're in that just sort of pushes them into this position of being the one who is saying, look at, you know, look at how young the, the women are here when they have children and look at how the, the sort of like othering or, um, you know, seeing the problems um, in this place that they slip into in the same way that uh, a soldier or a civilian peacekeeper from I don't know where, you know, from, from, from Germany or somewhere else might, you know, similar kind of reflections that they might have. So it's sort of both of those things at once. And then in terms of intergenerationality in the military, I think this is one of the big questions um, sort of going forward. And this gets back to the question of, you know, the people who were in Congo 20 years ago are now in positions of power, but they're also retiring um, because most of them retire at age 55. Um, some of them don't have to, but no. Um, a lot of them do. So a lot of them are sort of, they're reaching a, a retirement age and now there are these younger people coming up. And I think for a lot of people, um, the military is, it's a pretty good job. Um, you get paid regularly. Um, you have access to education. I met a lot of people who said, I really wanted to study, but I didn't have anybody to pay for me to study. And if I go into the military, then the military will support me to study, but also I'll make this extra money through peacekeeping. And I can use that to go back and, and study some more and then maybe get the kind of job that I would like to get. Um, and uh, it's also the case that there aren't very many, uh, you know, if, you, if you're from a country like Rwanda, um, this is changing a little bit uh, because now there are more opportunities to study abroad and things like that. But um, if you're somebody who wants to get out and see a bit of the world and travel, 
there aren't very many opportunities for that. But most of these officers who I got to know, they all go on um, military exchanges. They come to the United States. They go to China. Um, they go to lots of different, they go to Germany, they go to lots of different countries, um, Italy, um, for different kinds of trainings and workshops and seminars, they go to Kenya, they go to, you know, um, so it says something as well that, um, you know, that, that it's, it's, the military is the channel yeah. to that um, for people in a place like Rwanda, and, uh, and not something else. And maybe we could know, imagine what other opportunities could be fostered so that there were other channels too. I wonder if uh, Jocelyn is still online, but um, Dr. Chua, who um, is a faculty member here, in fact, we have quite a few of her students um, here today with us, asks, um, well, thanks you first, Louisa. Thank you for this uh, wonderful talk, Dr. Lombard. I'm wondering if you might talk a bit about uh, the particular value given to the role of women peacekeepers in international peacekeeping operations. Um, and how does this UN valuing of women peacekeepers look like in Rwanda? And how does it articulate with the Rwandan military as a gendered institution? Huh. So in the world of the UN, um, there's this push, they always want to have more women peacekeepers. And it's in a very, their interest in having women peacekeepers is much, uh, it's very um, reliant on kind of cliches and prejudices because there's this idea that if you have more women peacekeepers, then you'll have less um, problems with sexual exploitation, those kinds of things. Um, but also that women are sort of inherently peace, peacemakers and better communicators and all of these kinds of things. And so I mentioned this <laughs> new position of the MLO, the military liaison officer. These are often women <laughs> because the idea is, oh, it's a woman who's going to be good at talking to people and who can build this bridge between the mission and, um, and other people. Um, in the Rwandan military, they, um, there are a lot of women um, in the Rwandan military compared to a lot of other militaries in the region, um, but it's still not very many. I can't remember what the statistic is. I think in peacekeeping, something like 3% of the Rwandan peacekeepers are women, which is high by peacekeeping standards, but low by kind of anybody else's standards. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly. I mean, the, the, the Rwandan military too, it's sort of, well, I can speak about my experiences as a woman um, doing this research. I would say that I found it to be very, um, very, there, nobody, it, I, I had easy relationships with all the people I was um, doing research with, never felt you know, like there was some question about, well, wait, you're doing this, but you are a woman or something. There was a much more acceptance that you could have women in professional um, capacities doing things like this. Um, but I also saw that often, and not just saw, but also heard, you know, often the women soldiers would be sort of pushed into particular roles. Um, so MLO would be one, um, but also taking care of sort of budgets and accounting, um, some of these kinds of things uh, where they wouldn't have to be, um, you know, where that would be sort of, um, so there was there was definitely a, a gendering that was going on in terms of a lot of the, the work. Um, I know one uh, officer, she's no longer in the military, but she was in the insurgency in, in 94. And she claimed, she said that there was a really big difference um, in experience between the women who came into the insurgency who were well-educated, who had a university degree, and the women who did not. Um, and if you came in and you had this university degree, then you could go really go places and do things. And you had a lot of responsibility. And, and But if you came in and you didn't have that kind of education, then you were probably going to get pushed into all of these other kinds of roles of being a cook or doing, you know, those kinds of, of things. So she's she so that that made me attuned to to that as well as a kind of um, possible dividing line even among women um, within the military. Mm -hmm. okay. Two more, great. I think we'll make these the final, final two. Yeah. <laughs> My reflection on the same agenda. I had the chance to Mm. Uh, so 
their criteria when they send it to the peacekeepers, they they have very precise control of the image. They can find this all pushing a lot and they they go another country, they try to send it on women and she missed the flight. They don't have the skill to communicate or they don't have they don't speak English language is a barrier. Uh, with all these reasons, most of the time they don't send them to the home countries. Hmm. So, if they're aiming at sending from the fighters to take a quota, like how much is the to be able to get the country that is coming from the outside? I don't actually know if there's a push to have quotas or anything like that. I know that there is um, a lot of interest in having more women do peacekeeping. Uh, and so if, if a country is able to send women, then you know UN headquarters in New York would be very excited about that. <laughs> um, yeah. But I, I, it's, it's like they're trying to increase the number of women um, soldiers working as peacekeepers. Uh, but I don't know what all the specific mechanisms are that they're developing to try to do that. I think there's still more on the side of just maybe soft incentives um, and not setting specific rules. Yeah, uh, can you talk about how Rwandan peacekeepers help most of the life peacekeepers? Can you also talk about the, the UN single military? So I didn't, the first question was, what exactly, how? How are they supporting localized peace building initiatives? Oh. Why I asked that was,